Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Real Estate Rundown. Today, I've got the honor of having Omar Khan on the show. Say hello, Omar. Hey, everyone. How are you? Hey, Shan. Hey, so guys, uh, Omar comes to us uh, from, well, he actually spent some time in Canada, but he's been working in Texas, Florida, and Georgia. He's been in real estate for on his own now for about five years, but he's got generations of experience. Um, and with that, Omar has been able to amass over 1,200 doors that he's, that he's currently the uh, deal sponsor on and the operator. So, Omar, tell us a little bit more about your journey and what got you from, from really where you got started in real estate to where you are now. Well, look, to be very honest with you, like how I got started was my family had, has extensively invested in commercial real estate. So that's, if you want to say it started, that's kind of where I got started. But that wasn't me being active. That was me being more a recipient and being passive about it, right? Being invested in deals. I graduated from the University of Toronto, as I said, you know, as Shannon mentioned, I was Canadian. I went the whole finance, investment banking, I'm in a corporate finance route. Cup up, did that for about a decade, moved down to the US because I, my fiance at the time, my wife, she's a physician. So it was easier for me to move down than for her to move up. And when I moved down by that time, I had a good track record just on professional experiences working institutionally. And around the time I moved down, a really close friend of mine from Toronto, they have a small family office. They owned a lot of real estate assets in Houston. He gave me a call and said, hey, you're in Dallas. I have to go down to Houston because we're doing some estate planning inheritance for our family office. And why don't you join me? Because he didn't really have much of a financial background. He's a business guy, not much of a financial background. So I joined him there. We reorged a lot of their assets, reorged basically the structure of their holdings, extracted a lot of money because basically they wanted to pass on certain assets to certain kids. And, you know, the, the girls, as an example, they were married. They didn't really want to be involved in the business day to day. So to cut a long story short, did that, had, had a couple of really good experiences there. And then I just started doing my own deals. And the big impetuous there was, because when I moved down, I had always heard, you know, low taxes in America, Texas is well, practically no taxes. And then I moved down here and realized the hard, bitter truth. Jesus Christ, there's a lot of freaking taxes. Holy crap, <laughs> and I sold a bag of, I sold a bill of goods. And uh, around yeah. that time, you know, we were doing the math and you know, I mean, we were young and we were still comfortably paying to the six figures in taxes. And I knew about like commercial real estate and all the tax benefits. So when I started doing my deals, a big impetuous for that was to reduce our tax bill, essentially. And that's kind of how it got started. Luckily for me, because I'd worked on the institutional side, I had a lot of um, both professional experience in setting up structuring deals, but also personal network experience, you know, um, things where people could trust me with money because, you know, they, we had worked together. They kind of knew about my background, all that sort of stuff. A lot of different folks, uh, not like a lot of people, you know, whose life goal is to own real estate. I never had those goals. Uh, this was just being at the right place at the right time with a specific problem that could only be solved or rather was easier to solve to real estate than other areas. Sure. Well, you know, Omar, one of the things that we do have in common is, you know, I come from a real estate background. My, my mom is a third generation realtor. I had my license for a while. My son has his so five generations of real estate wow. broker in the nice and uh, and then my dad was a commercial builder so as you know uh, we I grew up building stuff seeing 1031s at the table you know all the things kids aren't supposed to see you know how to do math how to balance a checkbook you know how to pay your tax bill or how to avoid your tax bill by being involved in real estate so well, I would I use the word avoid I would say you optimize your tax liability optimize there you, you go you had it in your day Look, most people re read the tax code wrong. They read it as a penal code, and it's not. It is an encouraging book uh, that tells you how if you do certain things, you do not have to pay certain penalties. If you don't do those certain things, you pay certain penalties. So I, I look at that, that as a different, different way to, to look at that. But, you know, it's funny because as I grew older, I remember a lot of the conversations that were had around the dinner table about what was going on in the business and yeah. now how I was applying it to my life. And, you know, not only can in, can in real estate be a passive income stream, it can also be a passive learning stream because I didn't realize oh, yeah. how much of the stuff I was picking up as a kid. And now I'm here doing it in, in my world. And, and wow, that makes sense. And now I, now I know why my parents were trying to do that or, or what, what the end goal was there. But 
you know, on your road, I mean, you know, to, to acquire uh, over 1,200 doors in five years, you've had to be pretty active at that. And it sounds like a lot of your experience that you've had in the past was all about creating relationships that brought people to a position where they trusted you, they saw your work experience, they saw your work ethic, uh, they they could see your track record and they, they chose from there to invest with you. Is that, is that pretty accurate? Yeah, and look, that's by the way, 100% accurate. And the other deal also is look, in a lot of these uh, so-called conservative professions, like, right? you know, white shoe law firms, investment banking, uh, physicians, uh, private equity folks, you know, these old school sort of conventional conservative sort of professions, right? And to be honest with you, the only way you do get, say, even an entry into these is not just a test of intelligence, like, hey, you got good grades and you went in. A lot of times you get your first job, I know, in investment banking and for a fact in private equity and law to a certain degree is that, you know, you have to actively network. You have to go put yourself out there. You've got to talk. You've got to go introduce yourself to people. And a lot of times it's not the person who, and whether it's sad or not, I don't think it's sad, but to be honest with you, a lot of times it's not the most intelligent person who necessarily gets a job, gets the experience. And by intelligence, I mean conventional intelligence, right? Grades and all that. Sure. But those help, by the way, don't get me wrong. You, you, nobody wants to hire an idiot, right? But a lot of times- <laughs> I, I don't know, know. The American uh, people look at, look at repeat that. <laughs> Hey, well, I'm not going to go down that. I'm not going to touch that with the 10-foot pole, okay? But nobody wants to hire an idiot. But, you know, you people are more comfortable working with people, uh, especially in these high-pressure, pressure cooker situations, when they have some sort of a personal relationship. And right. that's just the way it is. Now, you can bitch about it and say, well, I don't know anyone. And, well, yeah, that kind of sucks. Or you can understand that's the way the game is played and then try to position yourself to play that game. So that's just the way it is. And that's, and that's so true. You know, where I come from a building background, you know, I've, I've not been in the syndication world very long. In fact, I wasn't even on Facebook uh, in Valentine's Day of this year. And I, I've had to create that by going out and introducing myself to people and, and meeting people in real life and, and everything because I'd always worked with partnerships. I'd always had a couple of partners that had some pretty decent sized checkbooks. They weren't, you know, my last deal was with a guy who uh, was with a family office. But other than that, I was, it was a very small network. And as I needed to grow it, I learned all these things that you're talking about. But I was, frick, I was 45, 46 years old, and I'm learning this for the first time because I've been out doing deals and building buildings, not really understanding how you put together the whole, the business of syndicating, the business of being a deal sponsor. And that, for me, has been a very short, very steep road. You seem to have climbed that just naturally and and from the conversation we had before the show started it wasn't even your first thought on what you were going to do for business it just seemed like a natural way to make money and and now here you are yeah look in my defense uh i would like to say that for instance i had some i had some i had some advantages coming in and i i'm fully cognizant of that right look when i say my family was investing in real estate to be honest with you, look, everybody owned their houses. And I've only now found this, like once I'm in this industry, I meet more people, that the weird part was pretty much most of the holdings my family had were commercial. They, nobody bought, went and bought houses. Nobody could be, I mean, everybody owned their house and maybe they have an extra house, wherever. But nobody like, you know, like how people say you got to buy houses and then you do like, there's some sort of like natural. Yeah, we didn't do any of that. And maybe I got lucky that way because now you see and you model yourself over people. You Inter, like you've talked about your parents, right? So, uh, I mean, and maybe it was because you grew up Canadian, you didn't play Monopoly like all of us Americans, right? Oh, we no, 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 hold on, hold on. I, 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 I lived in Canada and I also lived in Pakistan because I'm from there. But my family, by the way, my dad went to school in Berkeley back in the 70s and he was not a dirty hippie, just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> but, just to be know, clear everybody just to be clear about no, i'm not saying just, he likes to see look we still <laughs> like to take showers okay just saying right <laughs> but the thing is look i think it was a combination of that factor plus the fact that i was in finance on the institutional side and there right. for instance if you're doing say a billion dollar deal well, obviously i didn't have a billion dollars i'm merely a person working in a small team that does this I mean, not a lot of people are going to bring a billion dollars to the table. So you've got to work in teams. You've got to work in partnerships. Right. You've got yeah. to have a track record where you might say be short of money as an example. 
and you can go to a bunch of really deep pockets and with a, with this deep level of sophistication, tell them, look, here's what the project is, here's what I can give you, here's what I can't give you, and let's have a conversation. So right. those were things that were natural plus learned. So yes, right. this was a natural evolution, but I also had a lot of things going for me based on my personal and professional experiences. You know, Omar, that's, that's awesome that you recognize that you did have some advantages, but let's just be honest, it wouldn't, you wouldn't be where you're at. You wouldn't have achieved what you've achieved if it hadn't been for your hard work, taking advantage of the breaks that were given to you and maximizing those situations. Oh right? yeah, dude, like somebody can open a door. You still got to walk through the door. Yeah. You know, nobody's going to kick so, you through the door. Tell me, yeah. <laughs> tell me, tell me about one of your, t tell me about your first deal when you really, you know, when, when you're stepping away from, from working at your friend's family office and, and getting that whole thing taken care of you, you're looking at this, you're, you're going to, you, you know, you're going to do your first deal. What is it and how does it go? Look, in that particular case, what had happened is that, A, I knew I had to do it because of the tax situation, right? So that was understood by them. It wasn't like, should I do it? Should I not do it? Number one. Number two, uh, I already knew how to speak the investment management language. So when I was talking to brokers, I could immediately A, talk their language, but also when a broker was A, either full of shit or B, lying to me, you understand, look, they're not lying to you. That's just sales and that's what you got to do. So don't take it personally. That's our deal. And I know a lot of people just take it really personal. Well, how could he be saying this to me? I was like, dude, it's his job to sell you shit. What do you think he's going to say? Yeah. Right? right? Come on, help me out here, right? So that was that. And then basically because I could speak the language, it was a nice, easy way to get into like that profession, right? Because if you can obviously speak a language, no matter what profession you're in, that's an easier way to get in. And you don't right. have to quote unquote establish credibility because just the way you talk, present yourself, that already establishes credibility, right? So yeah. that's how we got in. Now, obviously there was a lot of learning steps in between choosing the right partners or not, which I didn't. Uh, and basically having, you know, backups on backups for, for equity sources. I got lucky on a few areas. So those right. were learning processes, but that's basically how it happened. I had a problem. I had lots of experiences around that problem and I knew I just had to go do it. So for me, I didn't look left. I didn't look right. I just looked ahead. Right. Well, and so, so you had a shorter road, right? Because you'd, you'd seen it played out. You'd seen it. Happen. Yeah. But the shorter road had taken 10 years of professional experience to get to that short road. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, it's short road yeah. only in context when you directly link it to say a deal, but there was a lot right. of experiences leading up to it. Yeah. Well, and that, that's where a lot of people don't don't go through that, right? Their their experience is not to go through the institutional level. It's to go, go through it from the level of okay, so I, I did I did ten fix and flips this year and five wholesales, and now I've got my nest egg up here to where I can go buy an eight plex. And then they you know they do the deal with the eight plex, and they're you know that same ten years they're positioning themselves to take down the first hundred unit. Uh, but there was a lot more uh, effort that went into the smaller real estate where you were able to apply your learn your trade from an institutional level, basically 30,000 foot view uh, to where you're seeing billion dollar deals done where most of us, you know, in, in the syndication world, we don't see deals of that size. Um, you know, you're probably able to get a pretty, pretty different perspective on how the deals get done. Do you see where kind of a homegrown syndicator that's come up doing that kind of stuff maybe thinks smaller than you or thinks no different than I, you or? look i disagree with that because you also have to realize when i moved to the u.s a couple of years ago i didn't know anyone right so right. whereas look i might have say the professional background i definitely did not have the social or personal background right so if look if you're right. born and raised in the u.s you already if say let's assume you live in a big city let's call it dallas as an example born and raised or let's assume you move there you you've already had some level of a social network you have some level of a personal network there they can make introductions to you now some now they might not be able to make all the introductions right but you are able to resonate more quickly with people than i would because i had to come here and build my entire network from scratch and all my professional knowledge would be for nothing if i don't go out and meet people and develop that network because right. I mean, you could be great at analyzing something. You still need something to analyze. Right. Right. <laughs> right? right. So look, I yeah. look, and look, by the way, look, we all have to play the game we're good at, right? So let's assume if you're a born and raised Texan, a uh, couple of generations you live here, your network runs so deep that I can't even compete in that game. 
right. right? So if I started playing your game, if I decided to wear a bunch of cowboy boots and acted like a redneck chewing, uh, you know, tobacco, well, I'd look like a freaking idiot, right? <laughs> Uh, but yeah. that being said, if I played that game, you know, I mean, there's no way I'm winning that game. Yeah, yeah. No, and that's and that, that's true. And you know, Omar, one of the things I hear you continuing to say is is that you know, maximizing the opportunities in front of you still takes a lot of effort. Oh yeah, every single day it takes a lot of effort. Yeah. Like I said, somebody can open the door. If you don't go through the door, well, that's on you. Yeah, yeah. So what would you say the outcome of this last year for your business has been? Look, so it positively and negatively, and I think they're both kind of related because I, again, the reason was solving the tax thing, but also now going out on our own and doing our own deals. I invest a lot of our own money into, or whatever money we have into our own deals, right? So from, it was all, it's really surprising to me in the last few months, especially once this coronavirus has hit, that I hear a lot of sponsors talking, well, we're playing defense now. And earlier they were talking about being an all-star team. And I was like, dude, like what kind of all-star team decides to suddenly play defense? Aren't you supposed to be playing defense all the time? Like what kind of championship winning team only plays offense, <laughs> right? <laughs> what, would you just stay in your half? And then you just, how does that work? So yeah. the, the frustrating part during the pre coronavirus time was because we invest our own money, uh, in certain cases we could be, end up losing on deals, whereas other people were just going gung-ho into those deals. But the flip side to that is, that is that so far, touch wood, we've kind of coasted through this coronavirus thing because we took all those steps up front because to be honest with you, a lot of it was our own money going into these deals. So, yeah. you, you know, we didn't go guns blazing into every deal. Well, and I think, you know, that has, that has a lot to do with it. And I think, you know, sometimes people forget that, you know, if you're not treating other people's money like your own and or um, using it like your own, and putting your own money in the deal, you're not going to be having it the same way. It's like I've seen, I've seen that now the uh, the, the corona uh, coronavirus underwritten, you know, pro formas. You know, um, why why weren't they always hedged yeah. like that? You know, people I mean, tell me this I mean, stuff. And in, like, in life, yeah. yeah, in our lifetime, I mean, we've had you know the Great Recession, we've had you know 9/11, we've had um, you know the the uh, the bubble in in um, the tech bubble back in the hey, 90s. Don't forget, you know, we've had, don't forget Epstein dying. That's true. I forgot that really, that really shook the markets, yeah. at least, uh, at least in the, in the uh, New York prison stock market. <laughs> <laughs> the matches were expensive that day, you yeah. know, uh, but, but you know, that's the thing, you know, you, you've got to have, you've got to have a sense there that things can change. I mean, we're in a, we're in an incredible time where we're seeing interest rates that I don't know that we'll ever see again in our lives. Hey, people um, have been saying yeah. this for the past five years and they're right. like, yeah, and they keep, it again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know, when you look at how things are being underwritten, you know, people are, people were being cavalier, you know, I completely agree with you on that. So when you're looking at a deal, what, what is it that you're, kind of right in your sweet spot. I mean, is that, that a unit? Is that no, no, no. So I can tell you straight up, even without going into the size of the deal, whatever, demographics, uh, which are basically driven by how diverse the, the place is, right? So if it's just skewed too much into one direction, um, that doesn't work. And income and schools. Honestly, if you nail those three down, uh, let's put it this way. You can have a, you can completely screw up and still not lose enough, not lose money versus God help you if you're, say, in the ghetto or the projects and you have the greatest deal in the world, but you're, you're just back is against the wall for no reason. Because if you're right. in a good market, you know, good schools, nice place to live, good incomes people have in that market, good retail, all that sort of deal. Look, you might not hit a home run, but you're not going to lose your money. Right. right. And rule number one is always to not lose your money. Right. Because if you don't lose your money and you live to fight another day, chances are eventually you'll be successful. Yeah. Right. And yeah. that beats losing your money. Yep. <laughs> that definitely does beat losing your money because then you got to go make some more money to get back in the game. And that's yeah. always difficult. What would you say to somebody that's looking to do their first deal? Um, what would you say is the most important thing that you've got to do to be successful in being the deal sponsor? Well, uh, I don't know if there's like the most successful thing, but I think you have to know yourself. So you have to know what your skill sets are and most importantly, what your weakness is. So if you're, say, really good at marketing and going out there, you're gregarious, meet people, 
uh, you know, first become a little professional <laughs> you know, at that. But maybe that's your skill. So if let's assume you, if you're really good at that, but you're not really good at numbers, forget about it. I mean, don't forget about it, but don't be as, don't worry about it too much. Try to find a partner who's the exact opposite of you and compliments you, right? But not just from a skills perspective, also from a values perspective. Hopefully you guys match from a values perspective. So try to do that because a lot of people try to do too many things by themselves. They try to wear too many hats and then they become mediocre and everything. Whereas it's right. better to be really good at one thing, try to find a partner who's good, opposite to you in that skill set and then both of you can go much further much more quickly yeah you know and that's one thing that i have i have seen in my life that you know the better i know myself and the less that i tell myself things that aren't real um the better off i'm going to be because i'm not trying to do things i'm not good at yeah. you can always hire into your weakness but if you hire if you don't believe you're you actually have a weakness then you'll wind up with something that's that's not like you said if you're if you think you're great at marketing, but you're really not, and you're not self-aware enough to realize that, then you're going to have a mess. But if you're aware enough, you can look at that and go, hey, I need to have somebody that has really good organizational skills and really good marketing skills so that we can put this together and be successful. More than likely, you will be. And yeah. um, it will definitely cut time off your trail. That's for sure. That's for sure. Oh yeah. So what do you see, what do you see the next couple of years look like for the, for the multifamily market? Uh, well, look, uh, I, I don't know for the market. I wish I had a crystal ball. For us, it's always kind of the same, you know, just keep chipping away at it at a couple of select markets. And for us, we're always looking at either distressed or semi-distressed assets with some story behind it, uh, with the idea being that uh, we come in, we do the hard yards in the first one and two years, refinance as much as possible, and then just ride the wave. And again, the only reason why we can, or, or people like us are, can ride the wave is because we're already in affluent or semi-affluent markets that are only poised to get better. So, and it's just the way it is, guys. Look, if uh, right. say a market is good, has good schools, good retail, all that jazz we all look for, right? Chances are that is going to stay like that versus some neighborhood that sucks and is in the process of gentrifying, which may or may not happen, right? So right. you can take that bet or you can take a short bet. And we right. prefer to take the short bet. We're not really speculating. Now, when you, when you look at that, Omar, to be a little bit clearer on that, you're also probably not in the 10 cap or the nine cap markets either. You're, no, no. you're looking at something that I have much I prefer to keep rate. my kidneys in my body, Shannon. I prefer to keep my kidneys in my body <laughs> when I go to tour a property. Yeah. yeah. I don't like you, to be shamed. You want to come... <laughs> sure well and at the end of the day you want to make sure that you know there's upside but it doesn't need to be you know you're, you're not looking for the best the absolute best deal just as far as a cash flow perspective you're looking at an overall yeah uh total growth story of, total growth story income and appreciation and by the way just to yeah. let you know i mean i know a lot of folks keep saying cash flow cash flow cash flow and i think a lot of these happen to be supremely unsophisticated investors because all the people I've read about, all the people I know, and I know a lot of successful people, they didn't just become rich by cash flowing an extra hundred dollars from their house. Okay? Right. They basically, uh, you know, invested or put their money into areas where they were getting good cash flow. So it's not like, you know, they ignored it, but the appreciation thing is what really made the rocket ship just go. Because if you don't get appreciation, and that's what I mean, it's not really going to help you. Right. And that's the one thing that I see, you know, where, you know, everything I do is new development, right? So I see that everything is appreciation, all, yeah. but I also have, I have to get some cash flow because at the end of the day, if, if all it is is appreciation, I mean, there's a lot of people that are starting out this game that have a hundred thousand dollars that want to know how they can retire on the, on the, you know, what kind of cash on cash return do they have to get to retire? Yeah, but Shannon, going, to be very honest with you, a lot, yeah, look, but to be honest with you, a lot of folks tell me that and I say, well, it's a sad commentary that people can't even do basic arithmetic. I was like, look, man, if you've got 200 grand, you're not retiring anytime soon. I don't give a shit what you invest your money in. I don't care if you start selling drugs. You're not retiring anytime soon, okay? It's not going to happen. Okay? So right. you've got to increase that pile of cash either through a business right. or a job or whatever because yep. I don't care what business you're in. Even if you get 40% cash on cash, if you only right. have $100, you're not going to get ahead. Okay, that's just right. That's good for a happy meal. Yeah, maybe. You know, yeah. Well, and that's and that's.
that's the point, right? People, I mean, people need to understand the benefit of that. And as you pointed out, you know, streamlining your tax uh, drag on your investment, that's also a big part of it. So if that's you can That's probably your biggest tax- expenditure if you think about it, outside of maybe your mortgage, but most people not yeah. even that. Yeah. Absolutely. Uncle Sam's there for, for his 30% or more, yeah. uh, unless you play the game right. And, uh, you know, so tightening up your tax strategies and then uh, being being able to get a combination of appreciation. And as you said, the the the, the better markets are going to give you better appreciation. The other side of that is if you bought in, it doesn't matter if you had 100 doors, if they're only worth $10 million and you get a 10% appreciation, yeah. You got a million dollars worth of appreciation, whereas if you bought a hundred doors that were a twenty million dollar cost, you're going to have a lot more appreciation. Yeah. There. So there's quite a bit there that that makes a lot of sense. That just is like you said, basic basic arithmetic that a lot of people forget about, and uh, they they skip that part and they go, "Man, I got eleven percent cash on cash." Well, you're right, but you are missing a kidney, like Omar said, and uh, you know, eleven percent cash on cash on a hundred bucks didn't buy you much. Yeah. So, so as you look at what you're doing next, Omar, where do you see your company growing in the next three to five years? Do you have a Do you have a goal as far as where you want to be, or what kind of door count you want, no. or is that something we need to ask your wife to tell us? I maybe need to ask my wife about that, but she's too busy these days. No, no where look, you want to be? <laughs> yeah. Look, I mean, to be honest with you, uh, by the grace of God, you know, we're comfortable. We're doing okay for ourselves. We always have been. Hopefully, we continue doing well for ourselves. So whereas, you know, there are broad goals, I don't necessarily have a door unit count goal because I feel a lot of guys go, I want to get a 1,000 units, and then they end up buying the hood. I'm like, dude, that's the last thing I want to do. So basically focusing, uh, a lot of my goals are basically making sure that I'm doing the fundamentals correctly, right? You know, I'm making those broker calls. I'm touring the properties, an X number of properties per month or per week, making an X number of calls, uh, you know, submitting a number of offers, you know, those sorts of metrics, as opposed to say a one, two, three, four year, because to be honest with you, nobody, nobody could have predicted the coronavirus. So you could have had the greatest plan in the world for 2020 and now coronavirus, <laughs> right? right? So a lot of my goals, yeah, are more, now, hey, uh, am I hitting, yeah, am I hitting my weekly, monthly goals or not? And a lot of those are process oriented goals. You know, and that's, and that's a really good point. Omar, that, that a lot of people forget, you know, just like you said earlier, I mean, you know, it's only 10 years of study to make it a five-year successful plan, right? I mean, yeah. it's the it's the small incremental goals, making the calls every week, doing the tours, making the introductions, you know, meeting the people. I was listening to uh, a book the, the other day, it, um, and uh, they were talking about, you know, if you make five contacts a day, and you do that for a year, that's 1,200 new contacts a year, you know, yeah. and and just how that magnification happens. And it's not that you're necessarily going to convert every single one of those people to an investor, but how do you know who is and who isn't if you're not making the contacts? Hey, so and you, that's a really your success point. rate can suck if you've got 1,200 people and you, your success rate could still be awful. And you'd still be yeah. way ahead of somebody who has 100% success rate but only knows five people. Right. You know? <laughs> that's true. That's true. And that's where I found myself in February or – yeah, in February, I was sitting there with, you know, no online presence and looking around trying to figure out how to how to get myself out there. And, and uh, I just realized that I had to go back to those fundamentals you talked about where you got to make the calls, you got to make the contacts, you got to set up the, well, you used to have lunch or coffee with people. Now we just, you know, you have your coffee, I have my coffee in a different place. But, uh, you know, so, you know, but you, you do what you can, but those fundamentals, like you said, will not change. And as long as you're continuing to do those, you will have success. Oh, and I'm so, a big believer, by the way, before, I'm sorry to butt, out, butt you out again. I'm telling you, this relationship business is like my dad told me this, and maybe because I'm a millennial, I didn't believe in the first couple of years. No amount of emails are, ev- yeah, no amount of emails are ever going to overcome a personal meeting or a phone call. It's just never going to happen. Right. Especially yeah. a personal meeting. A phone call is, say, number two on that list. It's personal meeting, right. phone call. And maybe an email, maybe. Right. And a lot of yeah. folks just get into the email habit, but you got to realize you have to go, well, you can't shake hands now, but maybe elbows, but you physically have to go meet people. There is just no other way around it. Yeah. No, and that's a really good point too, because, you know, millennials, I mean, there's an app for that. Well, there really isn't an app for meeting people and letting them understand who you are and, and yeah. you know, 
meeting them in person. So, uh, Omar, you got any good books you've been reading lately? I see a bookcase behind you. What's what are oh, a couple no, of good I, ones? I, I read a couple of books. I donate them. Then I get a whole bunch of books. I read them, donate them. Right. So that's what I kind of do. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, a lot of these books are like biographies right now. There's one of uh, the, the founder of Sony, you know, Sony, the company, uh, you know, the yeah. company. Akio Morita. There's oh yeah, there's one really one good one called "The Harder I Work, the Luckier I Get" by Joe Ricketts. It's uh, Joe Ricketts is the founder of TD Ameritrade or Ameritrade. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, so I'm gonna go through that. There's a biography of the founder of Turkey, uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, uh, and there's just a bunch of random stuff. You know, I just I, I don't I'm I just like reading about random things. I, I like reading, so anything that piques my curiosity, I just try to pick it up. Yeah. I'm I'm like you. I can't read the same thing all the time. So I read biographies. Then I read some fiction. Then yeah. I throw in some self help. Yeah, I know people love keeps... to read just business books, and I just I like to read them. But eventually, I'm just so bored out of my mind reading the same yeah. thing over and over again. Yeah. Well, and and you know everybody. I mean, there, there's a lot of fundamentals in one book that are in another book set a different way. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. So you've kind of got to get through those, but. Uh, well, Omar, uh, tell everybody where they can find you so that when they, when they get done watching this podcast, they can look you up and track you down and get some more information on you and your business and your investments. Sure. So you can go to our website, boardwalkwealth, B-O-A-R-D, walkwealth.com. I think that would be in the show notes. Uh, right on the front page, scroll a little down, you'll be able to have a little box on the bottom right. To name, email, how you find out about us, fill it out, click on the button, you'll get an email, verify your email, you'll be on our mailing list. You can also email me, Umar, O-M-A-R, at boardwalkwealth, one word, dot com. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Omar, for your time. I know that uh, my listeners are going to get a ton out of this because of the wealth and the information that you brought and just the practical experience. Uh, and... I liked it because you were a heck of a funny guy. It's not often <laughs> that I get guests that have um, a sense of humor. And... I'm very appreciative. I, I'm going to see, uh, hopefully you sent me the picture of your background so I can for sure yeah. know how much I'm missing out in life. That's right. Well, you know, you've always got a place to say here because we could do the next one live, right? Yeah, and I could just sleep on the beach like a beach mom. There you go. There you go. And then you could be that dirty hippie. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Talk oh, wait, to you. Joe, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for tuning in to the Real Estate Rundown. Omar, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Bye.